You're welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa and uh, happy Independence Day, Nigeria. This morning, we'll be taking a look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of the country called Nigeria as we celebrate our 61st independence anniversary. Joining us to do this is public affairs analyst, Mr. Okunabo Inkotaria. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Why does a lot of emphasis on all the things that are going wrong in Nigeria at the moment? I want us to begin with the positives. When you take a look at Nigeria since 1999, and then with a focus on the Buhari administration, what could you, you know, say would be one of the greatest achievements so far? The Buhari administration? Yes, please. Or from, uh, from independence? From it, independence it, 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 and the Buhari administration. Well, if it's from independence, uh, the greatest achievement thus far is that uh, we are still one. We, have not, we don't have uh, division, no, no division so far. The encasement is still one Nigeria. That's the greatest achievement thus far. I don't think there is any other achievement we can actually talk about. But if we talk of the Buhari's achievement, uh, the, railway, uh, the railway, I think that's all. Apart from the railway, there is really no other achievement. So, me, so you commend the rail infrastructure, basically. But we are in achievement. We are in achievement is prompted more of the negatives than the positives. Hmm. Well, uh, the president, you know, feels completely different. You know, of course, uh, from his, his speech this morning, he said that in the last six years we've achieved a lot more than we have achieved. Um, you know, since 1999, and um, you know, of course, uh, with moves to put Nigeria on the right path. Uh, so what, you know, may he be referring to? Is it, you know, improvement in the agricultural sector? Is it science and technology? Is it maybe infrastructure, the fight against corruption? Um, you know, of course, maybe, you know, improvement in our GDP. Which exactly would you say the president might be referring to? Um, I don't think the president, you know, it's, I would like to put it. Um, they say in the local parlance that which person mama should play the sweets? I mean, you don't expect Mr. President to come on air and uh, criticize himself or criticize his government. Uh, you don't expect that. He's going to come on air to give the impression, although in a few time manner, I say few time because as you are, nobody can convince you that you're a girl. Nobody can convince you that you're a woman. It's not possible. I mean, the facts tell us in the face. Are you talking of agriculture? If we talk of improvement in the agricultural sector, we are all aware of the hunger in the land. We are all aware of the skyrocketing prices of uh, food commodities. So what are we talking about? Because the whole essence of improvement in the agricultural sector is a reduction of prices. In this particular instance, the reverse is the case. The cost of living is extremely high. Are you going to talk of, uh, you mentioned one other thing, you mentioned about four other things. Please, can you remind me so that I can address it? So you talked about oh, I think I mentioned um, our GDP growth, agriculture, you know, science now, and technology. Now, GDP growth. Yeah. Now, now let, us, let us forget about the, the sophistry. Let's forget about uh, the, the rhapsody and go to the fast. When you say GDP, what is GDP? What does GDP mean? You have learned, you are you 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 educated, I'm educated. So we all understand when they say GDP. But does it make sense when it cannot translate? The common man should not even, without understanding what GDP is, should be able to live above very well, above board. That is the whole essence. When international communities talk of GDP, it translates. That's the whole, they are telling you this is the GDP, and by extension, it has improved on the lives, the economic lives of their citizens. Is that the case in Nigeria? That is not the case in Nigeria. Just yesterday, the day before, it was 580 naira to a dollar. So what GDP are we talking about? It makes it a whole nonsense. Are you going to tell the market woman GDP? Are you going to tell the capital GDP? Are you going to tell the proletariat GDP? It means nothing to them. What does it translate into? That is what the people... For the masses, that's not the high polar, that's what they're after. What will it translate into? You are talking of improved GDP, maybe why the cost of living is high. People can barely have the square meal in a day. So of what essence is the GDP? 
So let's forget about this whole grammar. The whole bottom line is cost of living. The market woman does not... Okay, as even as educated as you are, of what importance is the GDP to you if you cannot pay your children's school fees, if you cannot put food on the table, if you cannot pay your electricity bill, if you cannot uh, 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 do the basics. We are not talking of luxuries now. The basics of what importance is the GDP. Okay. So it doesn't make sense at all. You, you, you mentioned one other thing again, apart from the GDP. Oh, well, well I, I really was just sharing those things. I, I, we may not need to focus on them, you know, individually. You know, I just wanted to know what the president may have been referring to when he said that we've done, you know, pretty well compared to where speech. we. I don't even. From. I'm very sorry to say this on there. I don't even believe that the president understands what is being said. It's presented to him, and he's just doing that to the nation. That's not like it. If you tell the president to analyze the speech himself, he cannot even analyze that speech. It is written for him for, to read that to the nation. That's simple as it is. Well, many other people would disagree with you and say, you know, that seems, you know, almost yeah, like an insult to the president and his intelligence. I know you play the devil's advocate. And the only people that will disagree with me are those that are also benefiting from this system. That's a, those are the ones that are good. My, minority of them, because I believe majority of them are also disenchanted. So minority will just agree. Some are forced to agree because they don't have a choice. For example... Why Mohammed, the spokesperson, like the additional and co, are forced to agree because they don't have a choice. They have to defend the policy no matter how bad it is. That is what they are paid to do. But I can tell you that even those in the government, majority of them are not pleased because this is the worst government we've had, apart from the Abacha's government. This can be said to be the worst government in the history of this country. All right, oh. Mr. Mr. In Inkotaria. Um, sorry, Anita. Um, We've seen what the last uh, few weeks or months, you know, have been like here in Nigeria, um, and that includes security challenges. Um, yesterday, of course, we had to speak about the death of uh, Dr. Chike Akunyili. Uh, we've also seen, you know, about 35 uh, people or 38 people who were murdered uh, in uh, the north, in um, I think uh, Yobe State or, or Borno State, um, in the last uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, we've seen the secessionist agitations, you know, both from, you know, the Sunday Boho faction and, of course, Namdi Kanu. We've also seen, of course, the fight against corruption and how Nigeria has not really improved much in, in uh, uh, corruption index. Um, there's a lot of things, you know, that we can point out as, you know, major, major challenges Nigeria is currently dealing with. Do, would you argue that or would you agree with those who say that we were always heading down this path to where Nigeria is today? Um, and th these 61 years really um, have just been, you know, moving in this same trajectory. Um, and not, it's not necessarily the current administration that is to blame for where we are today. Well, uh, to a very large extent, I, I will say yes, because we are closing into a travesty called Nigeria. You know, you know I've always said on this program and on uh, a lot of other programs and know every other uh, for whom I, I have a chance to speak, that unless we agree on what I refer to as the modus vivendi, we will never have a fight. We will just be floundering in the morass of procedures. You see, Nigerians, are, we have different nations, it's made up of different nations, and we have failed to appreciate the fact that Nigeria is made up of different nations. We still see Nigeria as uh, what are the to as me twins. In other words, you cannot separate them. Uh, like the good of Jonathan, the leaders before him and after him have said, you cannot question the, uh, the indivisibility of this country. And I just laugh because, you see, what action is different from, words are different from action. You can tell me, you can shout, you cannot invade my premises, you cannot really rob my bills, you cannot do this. But the man with the gun is invading. You don't have a gun. You don't have any means of defending yourself. And he's invaded. You are just talking. He's doing the job. So you can see that the tennis league is under Buhari. It is because it is so accentuated under Buhari because of his style of leaders, capacitic leaders. That is why it's so accentuated. Others were able to manage the difference. But no doubt from 1914 up to this, it was snowballing. I agree with you. We're definitely going to get to the point of anarchy if we don't address the burning salient issue. We're definitely going to get to that. 
the president before him, they are able to manage. But there's a great difference between managing the conflict and resolving the conflict. What our leaders have been doing in this country is to manage the conflict and not resolve the conflict. And so it's best that. Because when you bounce back, like when you're pushed to the wall, you bounce back with the double devil. That is what is going on now. And that is why the issue of secession is assuming apocalyptic dimension. Because a lot of people are sick and tired of what is going on in this country. So a lot of people believe that stratagem is being employed just to keep the country together. Whereas it, will, it has to be a winning thing. Not, not, you don't need to coerce people. People must be winning. And how? You sit down and discuss. And we have had a lot of conferences in this country. And like I said before, we don't even need another national conference. It is completely unnecessary. All we need to do is conflate the various reports of all the conferences that have taken place. You add and subtract. And we are going to get a document, a workable and legitimate, not legal, legitimate document that Nigerians will work with. And everybody will be happy. But if we fail to do that, it's just a matter of time because we are headed slowly, steadily, and cautiously to rendezvous with anarchy. No amount of force can stop it. No amount of rhetoric can stop it. What will stop it is practical approach and the realization of the fact that we are different entities that are coming together for a common good. And unless that fact is realized, it will be to be a pretty illusion to think that Nigeria will exist for another 30 years. That will be a pretty illusion. Okay. So we know that there's been lots of criticism of the presidency regarding insecurity. But one of the things the presidency mentioned here is that despite how uh, it may be perceived by lots of Nigerians, that men and women of security agencies are actually taking the fight to the terrorists. And that, in fact, in the North alone, over 3,000 um, Boko Haram insurgents have act about, actually 8,000, over 8,000 Boko Haram terrorists have surrendered. He also went on to mention the thousands of personnel that have been recruited into um, the security space in Nigeria. Do you think that's something we should praise the president for? 8,000 um, surrendered Boko Haram terrorists and lots of investment in security. I will start by saying the federal government is complicit in the first security situation in the country. And those so called Boko Haram repentance, I don't think they are actually Boko Haram repentance. And allow me to lay the background. First and foremost, the President is sympathetic to these criminals they call bandits. If you could recall, he was the first person who said, if the Niger Delta militants could be given a why not Boko Haram? Then again, when Boko Haram, that was preceding his president, again, when Boko Haram nominated persons to represent them, the person they nominated was General Muhammad Ibuare. So there is a strong nexus between the bandit and Mr. President. Now, we also have the issue of Gumi. If a Southerner should say a thing less as uh, potent, as incendiary as Gumi has said, he would have been behind bars. Gumi was never the federal government's representative. Yet, Gumi went in, went in discussed with this book around the world, had pictures with them, but he never pleaded with them. Let's get this fast. He never pleaded with them. He never insisted on the cessation of hostilities by the book around the world. Rather, he gave the federal government a condition that unless they are granted armed, the Boko Haram, these bandits will continue in their youth. You can imagine daring Mr. President, daring the federal government. And yet, and Bumi also said that the federal government knows where these people are. That even the soldiers, the military commanders know where these people are. Bumi said it. I did not say it. I don't know national telling. What has happened? Nothing. That's why I said the federal government is complicit. Shortly after, they are talking of amnesty for this bandit. And they are saying talking of amnesty because the Niger Delta militants were given amnesty. But let us make the distinction here because they are not the same in any material particular. Let us make the distinction here. A militant is different from a bandit. The Niger Delta militants, all they did was to frustrate the exploration of oil in the Niger Delta region. 
on, and that is a way to command the attention of the federal government that have decided to turn his eyes that there is so much spirit out of the system with little or nothing to show for it. And Nigeria Delta, still tomorrow, are dying gradually because of the oil exploration and exploitation. The, the pernicious air they will. So they said, no, unless you address the Niger Delta issue, that we will not allow you to continue with this exploitation of oil in the Niger Delta region. They are talking about development. They did not bend their swing on the regions, on other regions. They did not go out to kill people. They were not kidnapping persons. No. This is different from banditry. These are terrorists who are now, this is an ethnocentric war, who are trying to force their own style of uh, uh, religion, their own style, lifestyle, on other people in the country. It's, there are two different things. I'm waging a war against the federal government. So you can never compare them. I mean, it's, it's a clear case of ethics of being and poverty of blood. Now, how do you grant this amnesty people pardon? Or uh, how do you grant this bandit amnesty? It is stupid. What are the family members they have killed? And this amnesty is only a decoy because they reintegrate. It has happened in Kaduna. It has happened in a few other states. They will reintegrate. They will come into the system, get reintegrated, get more convert, and will relaunch. Because what are you going to give to them? These are people that are used to receiving 50 million naira, 100 million naira, 200 million naira. So what are you going to give to them? And we are talking of prison congestion. Where, where, you where are you going to keep them? We have the IDP camp that you've not been able to take care of. And you're talking of 8,000 people. How are you going to reintegrate them into the system as a society? It is just not possible. Right. But just because the Niger Delta militants were not killed, just because they were not prosecuted, it is as if, why will you prosecute our own? Why will you kill our own? But the situations are different. The scenarios are quite different. These are criminals. What do you want against a country? These other ones are saying, don't come into my house. You're an armed robber, you're a thief. Don't come into my house. I'm talking about Niger Delta militants. So there are two different things all together. But the question of, if we don't kill these people, you cannot kill my own. And that is the problem we have in this country. All right, Mr. Angota. That is the pain. Um, so he cannot gloat. He cannot gloat. He, can, he cannot vote over the issue of repentant military. Those people who are, are not repentant military. They went and forced them to come out to claim, claiming they are, they, they are, they are repentant. They, the people, I don't think they came out willingly. I doubt it. And even the Kaduna State government has said it. That he's not going to negotiate with them. So what is the real problem? Why would you prosecute them? Um, I'm not sure if you can still hear us, or uh, we may have lost him briefly. I um, hope you know that we can reconnect with him the few minutes that we have left to uh, quickly speak on, you know, what he feels is. Uh, uh, Mr. Inkotara, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, final question for me. I, I, I want your thoughts on what you would describe as, you know, the most disappointing part of our journey in the last 61 years. Um, you know, and of course, uh, the failures with which we've, you know, well, the failures as a nation with being able to fix our leadership recruitment process, you know, maybe that would have put, put us on a better trajectory. Um, the influence of uh, the military, you know, since independence, you know, with different coups here and there. Uh, but what would you say has been the most disappointing part in the last 61 years? And um, which parts would you, you know, say um, has led to, you know, the slow pace of growth uh, for Nigeria as a country? The most disappointing part to me, not just the military incursions, as bad as they are or they were, not just the military incursions, but the fact that we still to realize that we are we, we have different nationalities in this country. And for as long as we deceive ourselves that we All right, seems so we may have lost him again. Um, but of course, uh, we're still discussing Nigeria 61 years later, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And of course, uh, seeing what uh, we've been able to achieve as a country, where we currently are headed, um, are we going to celebrate Nigeria at 62 and 63 and 65? Um, or, you know, is there going to be things that we may have to deal with in the future? And of course, does it seem in any way like Nigerians are proud of their country and their journey so far? Mm. Um, yes, indeed. The president did mention... Um, things about diversity, the fact that, you know, we're one great people, even though we have different cultures, different religions and things like that. But one of his final words was that um, security, um, the unity of Nigeria, non-negotiable was still, all hands must be on deck. We must all see 
the other person as an equal member of society. We must all value one another and we must work with the government to make sure the country is a better place. Yes, we're not where we want to be, but if we must get to where we want to go to, we can not but do that together. We're going to short break. When we come back, we're moving into a totally different conversation. And of course, in a bit to move forward, how much can we involve our young female Nigerians in science and technology? That's what comes up next here on The Breakfast. Good morning once again.